Hi, everyone. Um, I'll give us a minute to get situated here. And as some of you are coming in, um, Welcome all. Just, uh, uh, you know, FYI, uh, you, you, we've set up this meeting um, uh, to where audio, your audio and video um, are muted by default just to kind of keep things running smoothly. And we're going to um, uh, give a presentation and then run a Q&A in the chat. So um, I'll get us started here in a, a minute or two. Um, we're also going to record this session for the benefit of, um, folks who are, were not able to make either of our, uh, virtual open houses. So, but I'll, as I said, I'll, I'll, I'll give us a minute or another minute or two, maybe another minute for folks to, to come on in and then give a, us a more formal introduction. So glad to glad to see you all here uh, we've we've had great numbers for these and and really glad to see people are interested in our programs so. Okay, so um, it looks like uh, uh, the numbers are, are stabilizing a bit here. Um, we've got a, a, a nice group of folks here. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, yeah, kick us off and get started. Um, so yeah, welcome to uh, the afternoon session of CSU's Communication Studies Graduate Program's Virtual Open House. Um, like I said, uh, uh, really excited um, and, and glad to see uh, that so many of you are interested in our programs. Um, we're going to spend some time um, here talking about uh, some hallmarks of our various graduate programs, what make our what uh, the kinds of things that make our programs distinctive. Um, and then, like I said, uh, uh, answer any questions that you have um, about the application process, about the programs in general. Um, uh, uh, about anything that that feels sort of relevant to what you want to know about our graduate programs. And we'd ask you to um, put those questions in the chat. Uh, what I might ask is, uh, or, or what I think might be the best idea um, is to um, hold off on putting questions in the chat until uh, after we present, because I would imagine that um, the presentation will answer some of those questions uh, right off the bat. Um, but we will do our best to 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 get to to every one of and and all of your questions. Um, before we jump in, I want to uh, just do sort of some quick introductions. Um, I am Dr. Evan Elkins. I am a, an associate professor of film and media studies um, in the communication studies department here at Colorado State. Um, and I'm the interim director of graduate studies um, for this fall 2024 uh, semester. I'm joined by two of my esteemed colleagues uh, here in the department, um, Dr. Kari Anderson, who's in our rhetoric and civic engagement area, um, and Dr. Eric Aoki, who's in our relational and organizational communication area, um, as well as Coop Fan, who is our uh, programs coordinator. So um, some of you, I'm sure, have corresponded with uh, uh, one of us at, at some point. And uh, I want to add kind of at the outset that you should certainly feel welcome to um, continue that correspondence, follow up with with me and, and, and Coop. Uh, uh, if you have any further questions, um, want to learn more about the program. So uh, yeah, well, uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen here. I have um, uh, slideshow presentation uh, where uh, my colleagues and I are going to say a little bit about uh, our various graduate programs. So bear with me while I do that here. Okay. I'm hoping everyone can see this okay. Um, so let's see here. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, like I said, what I'm going to do is just kind of say a little bit, give an overview of uh, these, our graduate programs um, individually, uh, and then kind of talk a little bit, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what makes CSU um, distinctive uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a valuable place uh, to do communication studies, uh, graduate work um, in general. So we have three programs. Um, Two MA programs, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll go over some of the sort of specifics of what those programs uh, entail, um, what makes them different from each other, what makes them distinct, as well as a PhD program. So our MA in Communication Studies, our MA in Communication Studies with a, uh, a specialization in deliberative practices, um, and then our PhD in Communication. Before kind of getting into some of those specific details, kind of the nuts and bolts of what each uh, program entails. Um, I want to say a little bit about our values. So, um, you know, these bullet points, uh, uh, these sort of philosophies that are central to our programs, um, central to kind of the set of uh, uh, a sort of, you know, intellectual and scholarly philosophy and sort of ethic um, things that we try to instill, uh, uh, sort of model ourselves as, as faculty and departmental citizens and instill in you as, as uh, potential graduate students are, you know, that we want to give you a broad understanding of the discipline that is sort of balanced with um, very specific uh, and uh, precise uh, analysis of your uh, particular areas of interest. Um, we want to help you develop a, a range of methodological tools uh, that you can use to produce research and, and scholarly work that, uh, uh, you know, communicates to multiple communities. Um, that might be an academic community, that might be a, a broader public, it might be some combination of those, right? It might be an industry, a community in a particular industry you want to work in. Um, we really value uh, a diverse range of scholarly voices, you know, people from across different uh, backgrounds, different approaches to communication studies. Um, we want to develop you as uh, uh, teachers. Um, we, we really put a strong emphasis on um, developing teaching skills and teaching experience. Uh, which, you know, sort of aligns with our values of, of our broader value of developing you as, as you know, a sort of thoughtful professionals and a thoughtful professional ethic, right? Um, you know, someone who uh, uh, can learn those sort of time management skills, right? Balance lots of different things uh, uh, at once, right? But, um, but also you know, learn how to be a collegial colleague, right? And be part of an inclusive uh, departmental community. Um, these values are really important, really central, uh, really what we hold dear as a department, um, really in and across all of our graduate programs. And I wanna uh, uh, pass it off to my uh, my colleagues here to say a little bit more about um, about our culture, say a little bit more about these values, some of the things that uh, make our department distinctive in that regard. So we're really proud of the national reputation that our program has built. Um, our award-winning master's program has been one of the best programs in the nation for decades. Uh, and seven years ago, we launched a cutting edge PhD program that is intentionally different from many of the other programs that you'll be applying to. And so one of the things we're gonna talk about in this session is what makes uh, our program distinctive and different from the other ones that you have a chance to apply to. Um, it is responsive to current academic job market and already has produced uh, dozens of student conference paper awards essays in leading journals by students, and of course the faculty, uh, and placement of our graduate students in highly competitive tenure track faculty positions, um, mm -hmm. as well as careers outside of academia. Um, our faculty also are disciplinary leaders who've as edited major journals, won prestigious research awards, and who regularly are consulted by national and international journalistic outlets. Um, so we place a high premium on excellence in this program, but we also really, really care about nurturing a healthy culture. So Dr. Aoki is going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, just briefly, I would just add that uh, uh, along with these values of trying to uh, stimulate teaching, outstanding teaching um, 
uh, skills, also doing management and time orientation skills, leadership skills, building inclusive community. community. Uh, we, we work really hard to create a mutually respectful and supportive community that also emphasizes professionalism and excellence. Uh, the faculty like and respect one another. I think that's a wonderful thing to be able to say. And we often collaborate on research across our areas of emphasis as well. Uh, we also encourage our graduate students to form collegial and cooperative relationships uh, along with this modeling within the department. And so I'll leave it at there and, uh, and pitch back here to uh, Dr. Elkins to say a little bit more specifics about the programs. Thank you both. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, hope hope that gives a, a well-rounded view of um, what we're all about here. And I'll, you know, can, can kind of get into some of the, uh, yeah, some of these specifics that you might be interested in or, or might have some uh, uh, questions about. So, uh, I, I want to kind of start with thinking of uh, talking a little bit about uh, some of the things that are and some of the aspects of our programs that really are consistent across all three of our graduate programs. Um, all admitted students are fully funded um, through a monthly stipend for nine months um, that covers your tuition and student fees and you get health insurance with that. And that happens through a, a graduate teaching assistantship. So, you know, for, for two years, uh, that our, our two-year MA programs, you have that graduate te teaching assistantship, that funding for two years. Um, for our PhD program, you have that for four years because that's a four-year program. Um, and there are some occasional opportunities for smaller amounts of summer funding here and there, although we don't, uh, uh, can never, you know, fully guarantee that. Um, that graduate teaching assistantship is, uh, uh, you start off by teaching in our uh, award-winning public speaking class. Um, it's, you know, been recognized for many, many years as uh, uh, one of the best public speaking programs uh, in the country. Um, so you get that on the job training. Um, and you also serve as the instructor of record for that. Um, so, uh, I should say, you know, that's that's generally that that is how you will start. You will get, have that uh, graduate teaching assistantship, um, putting you in our sort of public speaking pedagogical program off the bat. But then, as you sort of move further in the program, uh, we really do have a range of, and I think pretty unique set of uh, graduate teaching teaching assistantship opportunities uh, to teach in your particular area of interest, right? Um, uh, course, different kinds of courses, um, some upper level courses sort of really across the range of the communication studies uh, curriculum. Um, and we also offer uh, really strong mentoring. We put a, we value that very highly and offer uh, financial support um, for research and conference travel. Graduate students in all of our programs work in all three areas of our curriculum, and I'll, I'll, I'll shortly sort of pass it back over to my colleagues to talk about each area in turn. Um, and it really is uh, in both the MA programs and the PhD programs, um, an interdisciplinary program, a curriculum that uh, uh, invites you to um, and, and asks you to take classes across these three areas of communication studies, um, collaborate and work with uh, students who you know, are doing work in and across all of these areas and develop a strong set of uh, uh, methods. Um, uh, we, put a, we put really strong emphasis and value very highly uh, developing a variety of methodological tools for you. Um, we also have a really strong record of, of success, both uh, alumni coming out of both our MA programs and our PhD programs getting uh, being really well placed in uh, academic positions, um, public sector jobs, private sector jobs. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we do have a really strong record of people being successful coming out of our programs as well. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm going to pass it back off to uh, my colleagues here uh, again, and um, first pass it back to Dr. Anderson, who's going to say a little bit about our rhetoric and civic engagement uh, area. Thank you. Yeah, so we have a lot of um, senior faculty who teach rhetoric. There we go. Um, and... 
Uh, we, we teach classes in a variety of areas. So faculty expertise includes um, public address, um, particularly United States public address and political culture, uh, deliberation and political culture. Uh, we do critical cultural studies and we have expertise in a queer theory, feminist theory, race and communication. Um, one of the new scholars that we just hired uh, does sports, uh, rhetoric, rhetoric, race, and sports. Um, we do uh, space and place, uh, as well as public memory research. Uh, and we also have somebody who is an expert in um, the rhetoric of women of the Supreme Court. So we've got a a breadth of experience and methodological orientations amongst the rhetoric faculty. Um, the other thing that we do pretty well, um, you know, Dr. Elkins already talked about how we are collaborative in our research, many of us, um, and that benefits our students on um, uh, research committees as well. Uh, so I work a lot with the media scholars on projects related to politics and popular culture. Um, so students put those kinds of committees together. Uh, we also currently have a PhD student who's really interested in organizational rhetoric. And so we are working, she's taking classes from the relating and org faculty members um, and also the rhetoric faculty members and is applying to a variety of jobs uh, that, where, um, that are seeking qualifications in both organizational com uh, and rhetoric. Um, so we've got a breadth of perspectives uh, amongst the rhetoric, rhetoric faculty and some flexibility in what our students can do with us. Um, so I will hand it over to Dr. Aoki to talk about uh, relational and organizational communication. Thanks, Dr. Anderson. Uh, in, in a big breath, uh, the relational and organizational communication is looking at the human to human uh, communicative interactions, pra communicative practices, uh, and engagements, uh, really interested in looking at uh, uh, human communication in context and a variety of contexts. So whether it's the interpersonal, whether it's the uh, uh, interpersonal relational, whether it's the organizational, uh, small group team kind of work and or the uh, uh, sort of broader community interactions that go on as well too. Uh, those are the, all the different uh, contexts in quote, oh, and I forgot intercultural and co-cultural as well too. Uh, those are the kind of contexts that we look at the human uh, communication uh, practices within, uh, looking at it from a range of both verbal and nonverbal communication, looking at it uh, in the dimensions of qualitative and quantitative research as well, the array of expertise that's uh, among the faculty lie in um, in, in, in sort of the groundings of looking at, for example, uh, entrepreneurship in, and leadership and crisis communication and organizations, looking at uh, interpersonal, uh, nonverbal, verbal identity construction uh, in family systems or in romantic relationships or, or friendship as well too, looking at the dimensions of uh, how community-based research is done, which also ties into the uh, thesis uh, plan B, uh, which uh, looks at a lot of engaged communicative practices at that community meso level of organization as well too. And then also looking at that international and intercultural dimensions of the ways that folks uh, uh, around the globe and in regional areas uh, um, uh, connect through communication practices as well. So I would say that that's the relational and organizational uh, in, in terms of like the expertise that lies within the um, uh, department, but also in the ways uh, that Dr. Anderson mentioned, that everything that I just gave you can also uh, have connectivity to other areas of the discipline as well too. So for example, uh, currently working with a graduate student who is looking at both the rhetoric of an organization uh, and, and looking at the rhetoric of a website uh, uh, the organization's website as well, and then also conducting um, a human, uh, a human to human kind of interviews and observations on site at a particular uh, place as well too. So uh, really bringing all three dimensions uh, in, a, in a nicely mixed methodological complex way to look at the research questions that this person is interested in uh, as well. That gives you a little bit of the r &O, and I'll hand it over to um, Dr. Elkins again to talk about film and media studies. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Yeah, so I uh, teach in the film and media studies area. So that uh, involves critical cultural analysis of 
film, television, digital media, games, uh, focusing on kind of an integrated approach to understanding texts, audiences, industries, and the broader culture in which they, they exist. So um, we have expertise, uh, you know, faculty with expertise in um, film history, television history, uh, uh, television and uh, new media comedy and satire, um, streaming media and globalization, uh, uh, digital culture, uh, media's relationship to politics and the economy. Um, and so, you know, if you're interested in doing work that, you know, takes on that sort of critical perspective on uh, on, on media, um, then, you know, we have faculty here that uh, would be uh, excited to work with you. Um, graduate students uh, in this area or who have worked kind of, you know, primarily in this area have looked at genre, um, analyzed kind of politics and aesthetics of, of the horror genre, um, the Me, Me Too movement in Hollywood, um, uh, uh, indigenous media cultures, uh, social media, live streaming apps, um, uh, uh, really anything that, uh, you know, any, any kind of culture that we experience through some kind of electronic mediation, uh, you know, is, is the kind of thing that, uh, we emphasize in this area. So, you know, across all of these three areas, right, uh, you're able to build out a, a very sort of customizable set of, you know, interests and kind of curriculum, uh, no matter what program you're in. Um, and often students do work across our, our, our areas. Uh, I really do want to emphasize that, right? So it's quite common that, um, for example, you know, a student might have, uh, be working on a, a thesis or a dissertation project that is, um, uh, a thesis or dissertation project that is, um, say, like a rhetoric and uh, media and popular culture uh, project, for example, right? Um, so I do want to say a little bit more then about what these programs actually entail and the kinds of work that you will be doing, the kinds of classes you might take, and what each one uh, looks like in turn. So uh, we have our, um, uh, I'll, I'll start with our MA in communication studies, uh, what, what we call the sort of plan A or the thesis track. Um, so this is uh, a program where you um, are doing academic work in communication studies. Uh, you'll take our MA core, uh, which uh, is listed here. So you'll take, you would take all um, five of these classes and then uh, augment that, supplement that with electives of your choice, you know, that naturally would uh, align with some of your own interests, right? Um, so the idea is that you get this, uh, uh, you know, survey, this sort of background in uh, the various disciplines and sub-disciplines of communication studies. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, then beyond that sort of help set yourself up to do your thesis work, which is, um, you know, an extended piece of uh, written research uh, that you write about, you know, answering some set of, of research questions, right? And so naturally, that's going to be, you know, more specific in its focus, um, in its disciplinary focus. Um, we have another master's program, which is our Plan B program. Uh, our deliberate, which is our specialization in deliberative practices. So you would take that same MA core. It's similarly giving you uh, sort of strong core multidisciplinary background in communication studies. Um, but uh, you, re instead of doing sort of an academic uh, written thesis or, or, or rather a, a written research thesis, I should say, um, you would complete an, an applied or engaged research project often, although not necessarily in collaboration with or through our Center for Public Deliberation, um, which is housed in uh, the department as well. Um, the, the Center for Public Deliberation is uh, a, a, an institution that you know we've uh, we've long had in this this uh, uh, in the communication studies department that works with the local community um, to solve uh, crucial problems, right? Um, to to get the public engaged in deliberating on these problems. So often the the applied or engaged research project will um, have some relationship to that, although it doesn't necessarily have to, right? But it is some kind of deliberative uh, uh, project. 
And uh, I'm going to pass it back to my colleagues again to say a little bit more about what makes these um, MA programs particularly distinctive. So when you're choosing an MA program, you're going to have a choice between a couple of different kinds of, of programs. So you've got pro, uh, universities that have terminal MA programs. They don't have a PhD in their department. And so all of their attention is focused on the master's student. We were one of those departments for a very long time. And that's how we built our master's program to, to be um, nationally known as it is. Uh, we the, the another option then is to go to a program like ours that has both a separate MA and PhD degree. In this program, you can come from your for your MA, but you're not directly admitted into the PhD program. Um, many of our students complete their MA and do apply and get into our PhD programs, but the two programs are separate. And then there are some schools, increasingly quite a, a number of schools, who will offer to direct you, admit you right into their PhD, and they don't really have a separate master's program, or they might allow you to leave with a master's degree after a year, but they don't have uh, a distinct master's experience. Um, and so what I would say is that uh, our program, having a distinct master's experience with a thesis year that can be applied or um, other kinds of research is really useful to you as a student because it allows you to do the kind of research that you want. Um, it's often difficult if you haven't done graduate school at all to know if you even want a PhD. Um, so we have students who leave with a master's degree in hand and take uh, jobs in the public and private sectors outside of academe or even take admin pro jobs uh, in universities. Um, but we also send our master's students to the top PhD programs in the nation, which includes us as well. Some choose to stay with us. Um, and we are excited to support students through any of those career paths. We feel that they are all good career paths for different people, and we just want to support you in attaining your goals. And so our program sort of gives you the best of both worlds. We have a distinct MA program. We are committed um, that our master's students will get the same level of mentoring as our PhD students. Um, that was one criteria for us when we launched the PhD is we didn't want it to undermine the great mentoring we do of master's students. And so, um, so we give you the sort of the best of both worlds in that. Um, and then I will say, uh, I, I will toss it to my colleague, uh, Dr. Aoki, to talk a, a little bit more about our professional development. But before I do that, we've mentioned a couple of times that we have an award-winning master's program. And I just want to tell you the two program level awards that we've won. Uh, we won NCA's uh, Master's in Education section Best Program Award, which is an, uh, a, it's a collective award that evaluates how we mentor students in teaching and as scholars. So it, it looks at the productivity of our master's students, the completion rate, as well as the mentoring we have in place. Uh, and then the other award we have won was uh, the National Communication Association's Basic Course Division's um, Excellence in Public Speaking, uh, the Program of Distinction in Public Speaking. And that again was for primarily the training and mentorship that we do of our graduate uh, students. Um, so I'm going to let Dr. Aoki tell you a little bit more about the professional development that we, we do for our master's students. Thanks, Dr. Anderson. Yes, uh, staying on the topic of, uh, and we'll get to PhD program distinctions in a bit, but uh, really looking at the MA program distinctions, uh, this builds really nicely from what you just uh, sort of laid the ground for there, uh, really emphasizing that we work really hard to build professional development into the curriculum, uh, offering uh, two professional development courses that will support your development as teachers and as scholars. Uh, you walk in uh, over the summer and and if you're uh, uh, coming in as an MA uh, student and also teaching the public speaking course that Dr. Anderson mentioned, um, going to be going through uh, just before the school year starts, going through a, a, a nicely scheduled and, and, and well uh, um, sort of uh, run program uh, from Dr. Katie Gibson to get you prepared to walk into that classroom with a lot of support uh, week to week as you go into pedagogy, uh, the pedagogy support course as well too, uh, so that you're consistently sharing information with uh, each other as a community and building off of that uh, information and problem solving along the ways as well too. In addition to that, there are courses on campus that Dr. Elkins will talk about in more depth, but 
or uh, teaching enhancement workshops that get done across uh, across the campus that are uh, uh, offered consistently uh, to help along uh, with regard to leadership and teaching. The other things I want to say is, uh, and I and I uh, believe Dr. Elkins mentioned this a little earlier, but MA students are all instructors of record in public speaking classes. Uh, uh, which provides a, a ton of opportunity uh, for resume building activities. And some of our MA students get the opportunity as well to assist in larger lection, uh, lecture courses uh, or run recitation uh, along with large uh, with uh, some of our base courses as well too. So there's opportunity to, to um, uh, grow into a different uh, style of teaching as well, different teaching experience, if you will, um, beyond the uh, public speaking course. And then I'll, I'll end by uh, uh, on a couple of things here. Um, our faculty mens mentors uh, mentor you as teachers and as scholars. Um, there's a, a pretty uh, uh, a sound practice of doors open and people around so that you can uh, walk in and, and, and ask uh, quick questions uh, to whoever's around at that given time. If in fact you have some teaching uh, concerns and or teaching questions that arise uh, in addition to the course director. And then finally, um, in the MA program, the opportunity to be in classes with PhD students uh, um, adds to the depth of the MA experience and opens up uh, and has opened up uh, um, that room for peer mentoringship and getting a sense of mentorship uh, within within the peer network for relationship building and that professional building network as well too. I'll leave it at that and then hand it back to Dr. Elkins to do a little setup for the PhD. Thanks, Dr. Key. And, and yeah, a, a lot of these, um, you know, all of these strengths and hallmarks uh, show up in our PhD program as well, which I'll say a little bit more about uh, right now. So, um, yeah, the PhD in communication uh, similarly invites you to get a broad, get a, 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 you know, breadth of background in communication studies while also encouraging you um, to, you know, develop really strong expertise in your particular area of, uh, your particular area of interest. And so um, in our PhD program, you'll take our PhD core, which uh, is really set to help you develop um, a strong set of writing um, and research and methodological uh, skills, right? And and really want to stress writing for multiple audiences. You'll see we have a seminar in academic writing, um, but one of the things that I think makes our, our program quite distinctive is that we also have a core class in professional writing and public scholarship. So we teach you not only to develop uh, really strong research-based writing uh, uh, or writing, uh, you know, research writing for an academic audience, um, but also how to translate that work um, and express it through multiple uh, kinds of public venues. Um, in addition, we give you, uh, uh, this core gives you a strong background in um, critical cultural approaches, uh, you know, sort of humanistic approaches to communication studies, as well as um, qualitative and quantitative uh, communication studies methods. Um, so again, we really do want to kind of give you that strong background. Um, similarly, you know, to the MA, you will uh, augment um, that core with courses, uh, electives that are sort of tailored to your interests. Um, and it's a four-year program, so, <clears throat> excuse me, the coursework is usually the first two, two and a half years, um, followed by your preliminary exams where, uh, you know, you develop reading lists and, and take uh, uh, written uh, exam responses to those, as well as develop some other materials, and then take about a year, year and a half to, to work on the dissertation, um, which is advised by a four-person committee of faculty from within and outside the department. Um, so, yeah, once again, to, to kind of talk about some other hallmarks of our um, PhD program, uh, I'll, I'll pass it uh, back to my colleagues here. Thanks. Um, so as I said, we developed this, or we, we launched this PhD program uh, seven years ago. So we do have a good track record, um, but it is still relatively new. And what that means is that we designed our curriculum, the curriculum that Dr. Elkins just went over um, around the current academic job market. Um, so what, one thing we noticed when we were thinking about and designing our PhD program is that faculty opportunities, opportunities for tenure track faculty positions are constricting nationwide. Um, and so departments are looking for people increasingly who can teach courses, you know, outside their immediate areas of specialty. Um, and also separately, our discipline is increasingly publishing multi-methodological research. You know, we've got 
uh, rhetoricians doing rhetorical field methods. We've got uh, social scientists who are also doing critical approaches, critical social science work. So we really wanted to capture both of those trends in our curriculum. Um, so our uh, one thing that I think distinguishes our PhD program is that we don't track students. We've said that you know already a number of times. Um, some people might want a program where they can just go deeply into one area, but we really feel like the flexibility of our curriculum has made our graduates more marketable. And that's one of the reasons that we have such a good placement rate um, with putting our PhD graduates uh, into academic and tenure track jobs. Um, and then our core requires you to develop multi-methodological research expertise, which is always going to pay off, even if it's a, a particular method that you think you don't use, it still helps you uh, communicate with your colleagues uh, and understand different kinds of research. I know that when I was uh, went to PhD school, I went to a rhetoric program, uh, didn't have the opportunity to take anything but rhetoric classes. Uh, but I ended up becoming a political communication scholar, which is half rhetoric and half social science. Um, and so I've had to sort of pick that up as I've gone along. Um, but I would have appreciated a graduate program that would have built that into the coursework. And that's something that we've done in our PhD program uh, and our master's program as well. Um, and then the last thing that I want to stress that make will make our PhD students a lot more marketable is that you get a range of teaching experiences. PhD students get to teach both lower and upper division courses. Um, they are instructors of record for upper division courses. They're developing the syllabus in many cases for those courses. And by the time you're done and with your four years in our program, you often will have taught four or five different courses uh, by the end. So that makes you competitive with applicants who've been out of grad school for a few years in visiting or temporary positions. Um, so all of that, uh, all of those program program features are things we put in place to make our students um, competitive with any student graduating from any program in the nation. Um, so I'll pass it off to Dr. Aoki now, who can tell you a few more other ways that our PhD program is distinctive. Oh, Dr. Aoki, you need to unmute. It was gonna happen at least once, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition to everything that you mentioned, it's a natural progression, kind of an organic progression to also be thinking um, that uh, there's a, a lot, uh, along with the national reputation, along with uh, the teaching opportunities that you mentioned, um, we have a faculty that are deeply involved and engaged in research and public scholarship, and hence want that mo wanted that modeling to happen uh, for the PhD, the doctoral students coming through as well. And so I think of, as part of the structure of the courses, that professional writing course and the public scholarship course, I've always said it's it's one of the things that I think makes us really distinct and and does an amazing amount of work of preparation for not only getting yourselves ready to uh, have things ready in the publication realm as doctoral students uh, uh, moving on to on to uh, your new careers, but also uh, being able to translate your work into public scholarship. Uh, we've got a lot of faculty who model that very well in terms of how that translation happens over and over again. Well, we fund our PhD students for four years, and uh, and then as part of that four years, help to do really good mentoring, I believe, and helping to develop articles for publication. It's kind of like that, how pro I was talking about earlier, how professionalism is built in to the curriculum and built into the structure. I, I think we've done a really good job to also build in uh, a sort of that uh, or sort of that organic growth for building uh, articles and publications to, uh, to come to be so that it is a sort of trajectory of, of momentum and, and clarity about how that gets done. And that's exactly what that professional writing course, academic writing course, uh, helps to uh, stimulate. There's other ways that that gets done as well, too, whether it's in our, uh, whether it's the, through that academic writing seminar or whether it's through the comprehensive exam process where, in, in fact, one of the options is to develop a paper for publication. And so getting a paper uh, that uh, that has uh, that you can develop towards uh, talking to your committee about and, and walking out of that uh, uh, that cycle of defense of, of process and defense, having an yet another uh, potential draft 
uh, of a good uh, piece of writing to then uh, carry forward and move forward into public publication is part of that process as well. Uh, as a result, our doctoral students are routinely published in the top journals, and we have had back-to-back -back winners of, our, of one of NCA's most prestigious early career awards, uh, the Stephen E. Lucas de uh, Debut Publication Award. And then also, finally, some of our graduate students, both MA and PhD, have also had the opportunity to collaborate with faculty on research teams and co-authored projects. Uh, sometimes that happens also, which you'll hear a little bit more about uh, during the summertime uh, when there's additional hours to be had uh, for, a, uh, for a set amount, but yet another way to get, get gain opportunity of learning about the research process with the mentoring, mentoring ship and overseeing of a faculty and or working on a project uh, 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 project uh, with that faculty as well, too. With that, um, uh, a little bit more uh, from Dr. Elkins on additional programs and some of the other opportunities that uh, the department offers. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, you know, we've we've talked about the curriculum, we've talked about the kind of classes you would take, the thesis, dissertation, that sort of stuff. But there's uh, uh, so much more that we offer um, beyond that. Uh, uh, extracurricular opportunities, ways to kind of supplement the the work you do through various sort of engaged projects, um, as well as various resources that we have for you here. Um, I talked about the Center for Public Deliberation a little bit, right? So if you're interested in kind of working on deliberative. Uh, solutions to community problems. Um, you can certainly do work with and through them, and, and many of our graduate students do. Our work lab um, is our communications research lab. So, uh, you know, particularly maybe for the more sort of social science oriented students, um, uh, there are resources there to um, do uh, uh, communication research. Uh, we have our Act Human Rights Film Festival, which is a you know become a, a pretty significant Northern Colorado um, event uh, run out of the department, <clears throat> which is um, an annual film festival that screens human rights uh, uh, human rights films, mostly documentaries. Um, we bring in filmmakers and and people involved in the films, subjects of the films, to kind of come give Q and A's, talks, that sort of thing. Um, and then there are other graduate certificates that you can get uh, that uh, exist across departments, some of which kind of incorporate some of our own classes. Um, the most common ones I think that, that students in our uh, programs tend to take are the gender power and difference uh, certificate, um, the political economy certificate, and the TILT. TILT is our um, teaching center on campus, uh, uh, the teaching certificate that they offer. Um, so actually, let me go back here. And I'm going to pass it back to my colleagues again, uh, just to talk a little bit more about Colorado and Fort Collins um, as locations, the sort of the uh, where, where CSU is situated um, and its sense of place. I'll just add quickly um, that Colorado State University and the Department of Communication Studies uh, is in a state with strong support for academic freedom, um, reproductive choice and support for queer and trans students and faculty. Um, we do that, uh, we, we take that to heart in the department, in a department that is looking at uh, uh, critical cultural, intercultural, cultural, uh, rhetoric, rhetoric and culture foundations of the ways that we do work, mediated uh, realms of representation of culture, all these different ways that we come at that. And so that uh, the importance of place is really situated well within both the department, but also in a, a, a state of support as well. Dr. Anderson, you wanna add a little to that? Yeah, we, we like to tell incoming graduate students, if you're not familiar with Colorado uh, or with sort of e the economic context in different states in the United States, um, co cost of living in Fort Collins is higher than in, in many towns, say in the Midwest. Um, we are comparable, I think, to cost of living um, in you know places more like California, um, I think there, there's a higher cost of living in, say, Austin, Texas and Boulder, Colorado, but, but Fort Collins is, is higher than many places that you might apply to go to graduate school. Um, but CSU knows this, and so both the institution and us as a department have built in some financial resources, some of which have already been mentioned, but I just wanted to frame them as 
um, this is the way that we're helping support you financially. Um, a big, the big one is that you don't pay student fees, and uh, at most institutions that saves you one to, between one and two thousand dollars a year, because um, fees are pretty hefty most places. You don't pay those. Um, health insurance is included, and so you have access to pretty high quality health uh, care through the health insurance. Both MA and PhD students um, do get support both for conference travel and there are funds they can apply to support, uh, you can apply for to support particular research projects, um, particularly thesis and, and dissertation research. Um, I will say that in times where our budget has constricted a little bit, um, the faculty consistently votes to support graduate student professional development, um, you know, resist cutting that. We would cut our own professional development before we cut yours. And so we do have a track record of supporting grad students in that way. Um, definitely ask uh, when you are applying to other graduate programs. Um, how they, if they support travel and and how that's allocated and applied for each year. Um, and then some students have the opportunity to work with faculty as research or teaching assistants for 40 hours in the summer. Now, I want to stress this isn't full-time summer employment. This is not a summer fellowship, um, but it is hourly employ employment for 40 hours. So it does get you you know, a bit of the way, uh, a bit of spending money in the summer, but then it also adds to um, CV building experiences. If you're a research assistant or if you're helping somebody, you know, in the class that they're teaching in the summer, all of those things are, are things that you can use to build your CV. So those are just some ways that we try to support you um, as you're meeting the challenges of uh, and the opportunities of going to grad school in Colorado. Thank you. And um, yeah, we're, we will have, uh, we'll get to our Q&A soon. But before we do that, I want to um, sort of preemptively cover some frequently asked questions, questions that uh, we often get from uh, prospective uh, applicants. So, uh, and, and just some, some logistics on applying, right? So the application deadline is December 15th. Um, the way that our admissions work is that we admit um, small cohorts once a year for fall semester enrollment, usually around eight MA students, um, if, you know, four to six PhD students per year. So, uh, so, so you don't need to contact individual faculty, uh, you know, to ask to join their research team. Um, that's not how our admission system works. Admissions decisions are made by graduate committee, um, and that whole cohort comes in once a year. Um, although the application deadline is on December 15th, CSU is holding a free application day, which is December 1st. Um, and I, I want to make sure I kind of underline this because it can be a little confusing. So you, in order to have your application fee waived, you have to submit your application by 1159. You have to submit it on the day, on December 1st. Uh, before or by 11.59 p.m. Mountain Time. Okay, so please make sure you're adjusting for your time zone uh, uh, as as needed. Um, we do have some minimum, minimum qualifications. So, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, students who don't meet these minimum qualifications listed here um, can't be considered for uh, admission. I will say, you know, I've, I've included some uh, uh, English proficiency proficiency test scores here. Um, and, uh, but those, we only need those if um, you are applying from a country or a part of the world that is not um, exempt from needing to, to submit that test. CSU's graduate school has an English profici proficiency page um, uh, that, that you know, tells, sort of clarifies all of that. Um, and we can send that around uh, as well. Um, Again, uh, just kind of underlining and covering this point again, all admitted students are fully funded um, through that financial support discussed earlier. You may re reach out to faculty if you want um, before applying, but you're not required to. So uh, uh, you certainly are welcome to um, email us, uh, ask us questions, um, but, but you don't have to do that before applying. 
And just some some kind of general tips um, if you're you know if you're interested in applying um, uh, just things that we've noticed uh, uh, and and we've you know read years and years worth of, of many graduate applications um, things that tend to lead to stronger applications are ones that are very specific. Um, about a number of things, right? Like what kinds of things you want to study, what kinds of things you want to research. We're not necessarily asking you to propose a dissertation topic or a thesis topic right away, right? We also want the program to, you, you know, we, we want you to be able to sort of build and develop that as you're in the program. But we do want to see that you have some kind of specific or, or, or precise or particular sense of what it is you want to study. Why communication studies as a discipline? Um, uh, which faculty do you want to work with? What do you want to do with this degree? And why CSU? Why our department? What is it about our department and our program specifically um, that uh, uh, you know you're why you're interested in in, in studying with us? Right. Um, again, these are the kinds of things that I think will make uh, you know generally will lead to a stronger um, application. Um, also, just please make sure you're following the guidelines and requirements, right? Getting the documents in that you need to get, getting everything in on time. Um, and again, while I said you don't have to reach out, uh, uh, you you certainly can if you have questions. Um, and I think especially if you have questions about the program in general uh, or the application, um, you can please feel free to contact me or Coop, and uh, we will answer any questions that you have. Um, speaking of questions, I will, uh, and, and here's our, our URL for our website. Um, uh, I, I do also uh, invite you to, to take a look at our, our website um, to learn more about us as well. Um, but yeah, speaking of questions, um, I will stop sharing my screen here and um, uh, change my own view. And yeah, I'll, I'll ask, uh, uh, do we have any questions in the chat that um, we can uh, field here in the last 10 minutes that we have here. Yeah, thank you for all of the, the great questions that you have shared in the chat and through direct messages. Um, I think you, you talked about it when you share the application chips, uh, but we also have like um, similar questions. What does the department prioritize when reviewing applications or what key factors does the department consider for admissions for both of the MA and PhD program? I don't know if you have um, any more tips or any more insights to add to respond to that question. Sure, I'll, I'll, um, uh, I can, I can start and then let my my colleagues sort of fill in uh, other things that I don't sort of get to. So yeah, I mean, we look at a number of things. We, you know, we certainly look at scholarly, uh, you know, that there's evidence and record of and potential for scholarly achievement. Right, um, you're going to be doing high level uh, uh, work um, in our in all of our programs, right? And and you know, we we want to 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 know that you are interested in doing that, and there's a, a record of doing that, right? Um, but we also, you know, want to see evidence that your application aligns with our department curriculum, our broader sort of mission. Um, we also year to year uh, make decisions based on programmatic needs, right? We we have, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, there there might be years when uh, based on people, you know, different faculty sort of advising loads or, or that sort of thing, we might need to. Um, sort of look for more students in a particular one of the sort of three areas, right? So it's it's really a, a, a you know, we try to balance all of those things as we look at applications. Um, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Aoki, did I leave anything out there? I know it's a quick rundown, but. I would say that we have a writing intensive program. And so we are, we do look closely at the writing sample. Um, and I would encourage you as your, this is true for all programs. I would really encourage you to be as honest as possible with your interests and what you're seeking in a program, rather than trying to like mold to what you think we might be looking for, really talk about what you're looking for. Because a graduate program is a is a big deal. And if, if you're not a natural fit with what our offerings are, it's probably better for everybody to know that sooner rather than later. So um, be real honest about what you want uh, and send us your very best writing sample. <laughs> Dr. Aoki, did I miss anything? That's good, thank you. Great, thanks. Other questions? I saw yeah, the next question. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I was going to say, I saw that somebody was asking about courses, um, other courses that were offered at the PhD level. Um, so it sort of depends on, on this, the interest area. Um, but I will say for rhetoric classes, we have this, we have a special topics number uh, that we can teach kind of whatever we want or whatever we're studying at that time. And so right now, for example, I'm teaching feminist theory. Dr. Tom Dunn is teaching queer theory. Um, Dr. Dickinson often teaches uh, space and place and public memory seminars that are related to whatever research he's doing. Um, I often teach a, a PhD elective that's politics and popular culture. Um, Dr. Katie Gibson teaches rhetoric and social movements classes, um, as well as feminist theory. So those are some of the electives that we regularly offer in rhetoric. Thanks. Yeah, we in in film and media studies, we we offer you know media industries, media audiences, media texts, as well as various um, uh, uh, seminars as well. Um, yeah, a, a, a range of things. We've had classes on uh, critical cultural approaches to uh, video games, media comedy. Um, uh, I've I've taught graduate seminars on digital media culture and media globalization. So yeah. Dr. Aoki, do you want to elaborate on courses on? Sure, I can do that. Uh, just courses in communication theory, uh, um, courses in gl uh, global diversity and communication uh, at that international level, looking at uh, courses in uh, um, uh, difference and othering, looking at on entrepreneurship and leadership types of uh, and crisis communication types of uh, elective courses, but also looking uh, uh, at courses that are going to get at interpersonal uh, uh, interpersonal theory, uh, as well as um, the organizational uh, communication theories as well, too. Another question that we had early on is about the uh, track A and track B in the MAs programs. Can a student be admitted to the deliberate practices track regarded of their area of interest among the three specialization areas? Is priority given to applicants for plan A or plan B based on the chosen area of specialization? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, I no, I don't think we, I guess what we want to see is um, that your area of interest aligns with the sort of goals and aims of the plan B program, right? So, I would say usually are, um, and and I'm kind of speaking anecdotal anecdotally here, but usually our students who are interested in the Plan B tend to um, study some combination of rhetoric and civic engagement and relational and organizational communication. Um, but you don't necessarily have to pick. I, I do want to stress you don't necessarily have to pick one of the three areas in a in, you know in a in a specific sense in, in your, or in that exact sense, I guess, in your, your application, right? Um, rather, I think it's more important to sort of show that your scholarly goals or your professional goals um, and your research interests um, uh, align with the kinds of deliberative theory and engage deliberative work that you would do in the plan B uh, program. I hope, I hope that answer makes sense. Um, yeah. Uh, Colleagues, of course, feel free to to jump in if there's more to say there. But yeah, there's a so I would say um, the good news is you don't actually you just apply to our master's program. You should tell us if you're interested in the deliberative practices specialization because we are indeed looking for people who are interested in that. But you're admitted to the master's program and you don't actually have to make a final decision on whether you're plan A or plan B until after you get here and you've taken a semester or a while, at least a semester of courses. I'm not sure, but I think you have to decide by the time you register for your second semester classes. Um, and then just to be sure that this is extra clear, the plan B is in deliberative practices. We don't have a plan B in every interest area. Um, but what Dr. Elkins was saying is true, that it seems like most of the folks who end up in deliberative practices 
are doing some sort of combination of they're interested in rhetoric and politics deliberation lens, or they're doing organizational deliberation in organizational contexts. So the plan B is deliberative practices, but you don't tell us that you're interested in it, but you're applying just to our master's program. And I would just quickly add, uh, you can learn about that deliberative practice focus through the Center for Public Deliberation uh, and the work that's getting done there. Uh, Dr. Elkins mentioned that the work that you do for your for that thesis, uh, Plan B, uh, can be connected to, but does not necessarily have to be connected to some of the research that the center is collecting as well, too. That's right. Um, well, th yeah, thank you all. Uh, gosh, um, we're about at 4.30. Uh, uh, time flies. I know we didn't get to every question, and so I really do want to stress... Um, uh, uh, please, please, please do feel free to reach out to me, uh, to reach out to, to Coop if you have questions that we didn't cover. You know, I know we usually, we, we, we always try to get to as many as we can. Um, again, I really want to thank you all for uh, attending this. It, 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 it's really amazing to see so many people, um, uh, yeah, interested in, you know, thinking about graduate school in communication studies, whatever happens and where, wherever you wind up. So um, yeah, please, please do keep open lines of communication and um, I'll let you all enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, yeah, it's great to see you all. Thank you again for coming. Thank you, Bye. everyone.